this presentation is about research conducted as a joint research effort by, uh, that I facilitated between myself, uh, Dr. Anton Tolman, Dr. Benjamin Johnson from Utah Valley University, um, who I've been working with for a couple of years on a couple of research projects. Uh, they are professors of uh, psychology and education, and they work with theories of behavior change. And so, after meeting uh, Willie and Christina, uh, I was able to facilitate a joint research effort where the theories on behavior change uh, from these professors, we got to develop a tool with Willie and Christina to, uh, to connect the metacognitive aspects of EduScrum the metacognitive benefits of EduScrum with the theories involved with uh, be human behavior change. So whether or not those connected, whether or not we could create a tool that helps people to adopt, uh, teachers, adopt and adapt EduScrum in their classroom, at their school, if there was a way to identify which teachers are ready to adopt and adapt, and which teachers might not be ready. And by identifying that, what can we do to better support those teachers in those different stages of change? Okay, so as an introduction, this study was just to validate the tool. That was what we were trying to do, to create a tool and validate the, the tool as being effective. Mm -hmm. Okay, so very excited to be working with this group, and uh, some of you uh, here and some of you in the international community may have actually taken this survey. Ah. So the purpose and the scope, uh, I mentioned a little bit about the purpose and the scope in the last slide, but essentially uh, the power of metacognition in school is something that is often overlooked in schools. A lot of teachers don't see the value in metacognitive teaching strategies because a lot of the strategies they use that may or may not be metacognitive have been working for them. And why change if what they're doing is working? So why adopt metacognition if what they're already doing is seen as effective? So that uh, knowing that metacognition has been proven to be effective is one of the reasons why we wanted to do this study, to promote metacognition as a successful approach to changing education for the better. Um, so the present survey, it connects the teacher stages of change to the metacognitive teaching strategies in the EduScrum framework. Um, we reached out only to the uh, participants who opted into EduScrum trainings. So the people that we surveyed were people who chose to participate in EduScrum training. So that's, a, that's an important detail as far as the scope and range of our outreach. Um, and that, that plays a role in the results that I'm going to talk about in a minute. Oh, this way. <laughs> now, this illustration is, uh, is an illustration of my design. It's based on the theory of behavior change that I've been using with Dr. Anton Tolman and Dr. Benjamin Johnson. This is, these are the stages of change according to Petraska's uh, trans-theoretical model for behavior change. There are five stages, but we, uh, well, Dr. Anton Tolman, took the first stage and broke it into two parts. He believes that there are two separate stages within this pre-contemplation stage where people who are adamantly opposed to a change, a behavior change, are, would fall into this stage. And somebody who is no on changing would be pre-contemplation one. And someone who is uh, accepting that that's great for you, but no for me is just another way of, of addressing that pre-contemplative uh, stage. And, it's, and so Dr. Coleman suggests <laughs> allowing that change to the original theory because that, show, that 
distinguishes between pre-contemplation and contemplation, where a teacher has an intent to change in the future. And so this is really a big focus for us in trying to figure out what strategies best support teachers who are in a pre-contemplation stage and supporting that shift to contemplation and instead of just expecting them to go immediately to the action stage. Question? Yeah, uh, but is it, uh, the, the question is, do I want to change or I want to adapt something new? I want to adapt something new. Okay. Yes, good question. Yeah. Um, because somebody might say, yeah, I'm open to new ideas. I'm open to change. And then you suggest a specific behavior and they say, no. <laughs> so we have to be very specific that we were talking about the edgy scrum framework. Okay. So so. The question was to the teachers, like, would you be willing to try a scrum in your classroom? That's, that's a good example yeah. of the kinds of yeah. yes phrasing that we would ask. Um, and so the other thing about this image that's important are these arrows that show a cycle because one of the most important parts of this theory is uh, it's called recycling. And when somebody is in a particular stage and they regress backwards, that's not a bad thing. That is a natural part of the change process. And by promoting the idea, intentionally promoting this idea that a person can get all the way to planning and be ready for action and something might happen in their lives, outside of their control, that might place them back into pre-contemplation. And by recognizing that as a natural part of this change process, you can intentionally address those instances and not be upset with them, but rather be more compassionate and start with these strategies and not continue promoting strategies that they are no, that are no longer going to work for that person. So it's, it allows leadership to be more intentional about helping people get to an action and maintenance stage. Um, with intention. So that's the idea behind the theory that we were working with on the research level. Uh, next slide. Uh, okay, so there were, the, this, is, this slide is about the actual survey that we created between me, uh, Dr. Anton Tolman, Dr. Benjamin Johnson, Willie, and Christina. So we all met and talked for many, many months on, ex on figuring out exactly what it was about EduScrum that was metacognitive mm -hmm. and how to phrase mm -hmm. statements of belief <coughs> that were relevant to EduScrum that promoted that change, uh, the, the change through the stages. Mm -hmm. So it took a long time for us to get through and create a meaningful tool and so these were the parts, there were five parts. The first one was specific to the stage of change. Uh, part two, ask teachers um, interested in EduScrum, how often do you do these EduScrum related practices? Okay, no problem. Part three, ask them about how confident they are in using practices related to EduScrum because confidence and self-efficacy is different than our belief in our capacity and whether or not we're doing it. Self-efficacy is a big part of behavior change. And somebody who has a lower self-confidence um, might find themselves in a particular stage of change and we were curious if we could align that through this work with, edu with the EduScrum framework. Uh, part four, roles and responsibilities. That one I'm going to talk about uh, a lot because there were some uh, concerns about the validity of those statements. So I'm excited to talk about that when I, when I when we get to roles and responsibilities. Be sure to ask me about that because it's interesting. And then a couple of demographic, demographic questions just to kind of know who we're talking to. So it took a while to 
um, designed this, so forgive me for talking about it so long, it was a big project, and uh, this whole project was actually a year and a half in the making, and right now, this week, is a celebration of that year and a half of research. So, uh, forgive me for being very excited about that. <laughs> And thank, thank you to all of you as well. Uh, now, the findings. Um, we had 56 total participants, teachers interested in EduScript. Uh, 56 total participants consented. They said, yes, I am happy to take this survey. Sure. Um, not all of them answered every question, uh, but most of them did. So. Uh, with that said, uh, where they all came from, uh, we made sure to ask not where did you, where, what is your country of origin, we asked, in what country are you teaching? We felt that was a very important distinction uh, in how we phrased that. Uh, because where you're teaching matters. Uh, there's a that gets into the roles and responsibilities in the context of the cultures of the schools that they were in. Um, so many teachers were uh, here in, in Europe, and so we grouped them accordingly uh, to, uh, to sort of acknowledge that, yes, there are, we did have a couple of teachers from Asia, we did have a couple of teachers in uh, North America, and Canada, uh, US. So it was a pretty wide range, most of whom were in Germany. Uh, so that was a big one. Um, and then 63% uh, of them were in the Edu Scrum training workshop. So this just uh, clarifies the fact that these, this is where our participants were gathered. We didn't go out to schools and ask people. We got them straight from the Edu Scrum training workshops, primarily. Okay. Okay, so. Um, here we are with the actual breakdown of the stages of change <coughs> where teachers who entered the Edu Scrum training were asked specifically what stage, they, they were given statements, what, which of the statements uh, reflect where you are at. And most of the teachers believed that they were in these higher stages of preparation, of action, yes, I'm, I'm doing it, I've been doing it, or maintenance, I've been doing it for a while, uh, more than a year or two. And so the fact that ed, the Edu Scrum trainings are attracting people who believe that they are in these higher stages of change, that, uh, that has a very powerful meaning to the data uh, that we're collecting. Uh, but that's not the only type of uh, stage of change that we uh, we asked about. This was specific to their individual readiness to adopt Edu Scrum. There was one other stage of readiness that we asked about, and it was their readiness to adopt a collaborative teaching environment. Not just Edu Scrum, but how ready are you to adopt a collaborative learning environment? So we were curious about that as well, and most of the participants felt that they were in an action stage of readiness for collaborative learning environments. So again, where we got the participants mattered. The results and the, uh, the validity of this survey was with a very homogenous group of teachers based on their, their stages of change. So that's really important to consider. Um, with 60% in the action, almost two-thirds in uh, action and maintenance. So everyone seemed to be very much on board with collaborative learning already. So then, so then we asked, how much time do you spend in your classroom using collaborative learning strategies? And it was pretty, pretty uh, scattered. Um, it, it was pretty even across the board. There were a lot of teachers who said, not really, as much as there were teachers who said, all the time, I use, use collaborative learning strategies, all the time. Um, 
And because it was so spaced out, we felt that that, was, uh, that ended up being a really interesting uh, data point to consider when we're talking about how people feel about their practices, their teaching practices, whether or not they are ready to adopt collaborative teaching practices, whether they're uh, ready to adopt EduScrum as a framework, um, how often they're doing this, because there's such a wide range, we felt that mm, maybe how often they believe they're already doing it is not a condition that we should say would stop somebody from adopting these kinds of frameworks. So this was an important data to, to sort of disprove that that would be a distinction that we would uh, apply to um, different conclusions. Okay. Okay, right, so here we get into the research part of it, the data, the whole cold hard data, where in the first part of that survey that looked at the frequency of practices, how often are, are teachers using EduScrum practices? What this chart shows in a nutshell is there is a very high uh, uh, what's the uh, correlation between the questions that shows that the validity of the survey is consistent across all of the participants. These numbers reflect a high consistency, a high correlation between the responses, which, uh, which is a way of showing, using data to prove that the survey is valid. If these numbers were lower than 0.3, that is a common red flag to say there is a problem with the questions and how people are responding to them. There is an inconsistency that we need to address. So when it's lower than 0.3, we need to pay attention to that. But as you can see, all of these numbers are well over that sort of, that sort of line of, of 0.3. And, and people have different opinions about where that line is, whether it's 0 0.2, 0 0.4. It really matters about the context, and for us, the context uh, pointed to these numbers being representative of a highly valid section of the survey. Yes? Uh, for us to understand your findings, is it important to know what Q1 to Q45 stands for? Ah, this first section had five questions. Ah. Yes. So the Q is for question. Thank you. And what's the difference between your X and Y axes? Ah. So what are you correlating with what? So correlating question two and question one, there is a very high correlation in the responses. Okay. And so I, I deleted right. these because it would be a mirror of. So you have the lowest correlation between question one and question five. Okay. That is correct. And we don't know what question one and question fives are. Um, I did not. I decided not to post all of the statements okay. just for visual sake. Uh, but the uh, the data it, this data reflects the questions uh, to show that the this first section had a high validity. Uh, so that was the point of the research was to see if this tool is valid because once it's proven to be that well, once it's proven once it's shown to be valid then we can go to this next phase and start using it and really testing it because we've shown that it has, uh, that it is effective, it is valid. So this is, uh, this is surprisingly exciting from the research university side of things. <laughs> uh, we love to see these higher numbers. Um, so the second section had to do with confidence. There it goes. So the confidence in people's EduScrum practices, and you can see these numbers are again pretty good, pretty good, considering the fact that we put a uh, 0.3 kind of line there to say that if it's over that number, it's going to reflects high validity. Um, and so 0 0.6, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.8. It, these reflect a very high validity, a high, very high consistency in the responses for this validity research. Yes? Are these different uh, five questions or the same five questions? These are different questions 
the, the first section was how frequently do you do these practices? And this section was how confident are you in using these particular practices? Excellent questions. Please keep them coming. Yes. So don't need to go into any more detail about that. The point is the second section was shown to be highly valid. The third <coughs> section of the survey had to do with roles and responsibilities. And I remember I was going to say something about this. Because there were teachers teaching in countries, because we asked them, what, in what country do you teach? Well, because you can already tell that there's some red squares here. <laughs> and so this is what I was excited to talk about, is we were concerned that the section was invalid as a survey, that section of the survey, until we, in our discussions, we considered, well, maybe the role and responsibility of the teacher is cultural. Mm -hmm. Asking the teachers how they feel about the authority that teachers should have in the classroom, how much responsibility students should have over their own learning, relates to the EduScrum framework, yes, but a teacher's beliefs are likely going to be influenced by the culture of the school that they're in. So because of that, I, well, we, <laughs> make the argument that we are going to keep these questions the way they are, because in the context of this section, these lower numbers don't necessarily mean they're invalid. They actually re reflect the fact that we're going to have differences in opinions in how we perceive the roles or responsibilities of teachers and students in the classroom, and that the actual responses would be important for administrators and, and us as a research team to reflect on. Yes, question? Um, have you um, looked at um, answers, specific answers, coming from specific countries, so that you find, like, in question three, I don't know, teachers from Russia have uh, certain answers that are typical uh, compared to, let's say, a teacher from Argentina. I am currently waiting for those ANOVAs, uh, those, those particular connections, um, based on country of origin, origin where they're teaching. Yeah. Um, and also, I was curious about teachers who uh, responded in a particular stage of change, how frequently do they use these strategies? Um, and whether or not there's an increased uh, correlation uh, between those as well. So there are those types of more deep analyses that we're still doing. Uh, so that is that's definitely one of the things that we're looking into. It's, it's a fascinating study. And so we're getting a lot of good information. Yes? Did you have any teachers that work in Poland in the research? Maybe. Did you have like 1,000 teachers already trained in the research? Now, because we have a valid survey, we would be able to go to Poland and do a secondary research survey. So in this one, you didn't have yet? I don't know how many in okay. Europe and which specific countries, uh, we'd have to break that out. Yeah. Um, so if we have one or two, then we, that would be great. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, so this is actually, as, as boring as data can be sometimes, for some people, we found this to be very exciting. And uh, topics for discussion about whether or not the survey is valid, survey could be used with more teachers, and whether or not these are actual red flags that say, no, the tool isn't working. Instead, we saw that the context of roles and responsibilities as a section of a survey, we want to know if teachers have these differing views. And so we considered this valid. So we were very excited after we talked about it and decided we're going to keep it. So, um, okay, just I think there's only two more slides, because <laughs> then we go too much. Um, this is where we get into 
the so what. Now that we have a valid survey, what does this mean? What can we do with this? And we brainstormed a little bit, and this is some of the ideas that we've come up with. So already, the low reliability and roles and responsibilities that we were excited to talk about doesn't necessarily mean it's invalid. It means that there's important information that we want to make sure we collect. So that, that was one takeaway that we made sure to put into this slide. Uh, the higher TTM stages, we, our initial look at the data shows that the higher TTM stages reflect higher frequency and practices. That one was, that, that's really big. Uh, we didn't have the, uh, I didn't get the ANOVAs, the actual hard pull data uh, from my professor. Uh, so that takeaway is on trust because he has the data. <laughs> uh, and so I would have egg in face if um, he sent the data and it was not true. So I believe my professor as a teammate. <laughs> Um, and so the high frequency and the high confidence, those people who have the higher confidence, those people who have the higher frequency of these practices have a higher stage of change. So by identifying a person's stage of change, there's a likelihood that they're going to have a higher frequency of these practices and a higher self-efficacy. So that's really important when we consider, um, oh, and the lack of pre-contemplation, um, I think I mentioned this last night, that uh, because the outreach effort was specific to EduScrum people, that people already interested in EduScrum, that the lack of pre-contemplation stage responses means that there is room for more research, and I think that that's going to be a fascinating secondary follow-up uh, study to be done somewhere in the world with more EduScrum folks. Uh, so then the implications, what can we do with this? The survey results are going to inform teachers, school leaders, organizations, how best to personalize professional development. Mm -hmm. That is already something that this tool is going to be useful uh, for us to have. Uh, the survey results may also inform specific trainers. If you are a consultant, then as a trainer or instructor, which strategies you need to use for each client is going to allow you to identify how to get them not just to the action stage. You don't want them to just start doing this. You're going to have burnout, you're going to have failure, you're going to have false starts. Uh, there are lots of theories of organizational change that show that that kind of fast approach results in failure. So instead, helping people shift from one stage to the next is an approach that I think a lot of trainers are going to find useful based on the results from the survey that they can use in their own practice. Lastly, the self-assessment survey, it actually might serve as, a, um, as an intervention in and of itself. Just taking the survey and asking yourself which statement reflects where I'm at might actually have an effect on the people you're coaching on the teachers in your school. And so there, there might actually be, um, I've used these stages of change in different formats, in different ways, in different topics, and I've asked teachers, at the, before you took the survey, you said you were at this stage, once you were done reflecting on the strategies and the confidence and the role and responsibilities, would you have responded to that, those statements of change differently after going through the survey? And most of them said, actually, yeah. Yeah. And so the survey itself can, doesn't, doesn't mean it will, it can serve as a means for intervention in and of itself, something to use as a discussion tool. So lots of implications for how this research can be useful for edgy scrum trainers. Okay. And? Click. Ha <laughs> ha. Oh, no. <laughs> So, uh, obviously, more research is needed, but the fact that we now have a valid uh, self-assessment tool for us to use with school leaders, with instructors, with coaches, for teachers, 
I think this could be something that um, around the world more research can be done and these are our email addresses to reach out and set up more research opportunities uh, because there may be organizations interested in, pro in having research specific to their efforts that we can help develop. And so it's just a matter of figuring out what it is that you're trying to find and creating a tool, adapting a tool, or using this tool in a way that is meaningful to your goals. So, with that, I say thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, now would be it. Yes? Okay. I'm not sure how to ask this question. You said this is a metacognitive instrument. You are asking in which stage people are in this TTM mode, model. Yes. So where do they <coughs> sorry, where do they see themselves? Is that part of their metacognition? Or I, I'm not sure I understand the relation between TTM and meta because from I thought metacognition is like how does my cognition work? So I um, metacognition is my knowledge of how I work in cognitive situations. So how does this T if I'm right, if how does this TTM kind of what what part of my metacognition is it? Do you understand the question or is it Chinese? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm I'm smiling and shaking my head yes because I completely understand yeah. what it is that you're asking. The concept of metacognition is, is often explained as, uh, there's a phrase that people like to use, it's thinking about thinking. That's a very dumbed down way of explaining what metacognition is. And metacognition is actually a much broader world of, of knowledge and, and actions. And it actually involves more self-regulation uh, social awareness, um, emotional awareness, self-awareness, and, and regulation. Um, so there are a lot of aspects that include, that are cognitive, that are also social and emotional. So metacognition is much bigger than we have been led to believe. So our awareness of our process of change is a metacognitive process. <clears throat> I can say that one more time. So part of metacognition is um, how I see myself related to change and my role in it and my ability to kind of work with it. Yes. Okay, thank you. That was beautiful. Write that down. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Just brief, can you remind me what TTM is? Yes, of course. Uh, the TTM is uh, an acronym for the Trans Theoretical model. Okay. This blue thing? Uh, yeah, yeah, now I know what it is, but it just, uh, at some point... Of and the, 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 the name is representative don't... of the idea that, uh, that it was developed for medical purposes mm -hmm. to uh, address uh, challenges and behaviors related to health, smoking, exercise, uh, you know, drug abuse, uh, alcoholism. And so it was an idea that uh, psychologists would use different therapies mm -hmm for different people, for different reasons. And this theory connected all of the different therapies to show that no matter what therapy you're using, there is a underlying series, stages of change that that therapy is assisting with. Starting at some stages and others, and, uh, but it all, all of them follow this trans-theoretical, no matter what theory or, or therapy, this Thank is you the model. Thank you that model. now explains yes. what trans theoretical yes. is. Thank you. Thank you for asking. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah. I have a few questions. Okay. Let's start with one. First of all, uh, you will share with us with the result of this survey uh, because it's very interesting because uh, what I see that we can uh, project, we can design some next steps. So what we as a trainers, we can do about it because those results... Uh, uh, showing uh, also the way how we teach 
our teachers of Edusgram. To meet so, them in their place, yes? To meet them where yes, they are. Yes, uh, so uh, this is the first question. Uh, second question is, uh, when will be the second edition of the survey? Because uh, my idea is to include as much as we can uh, teachers, because there's yeah. a lot of teachers, for example, in Poland, in Poland. and probably in other countries, oh, yeah. uh, especially that uh, we found out that uh, even we trained about 1,000 teachers, but still, there's a lot of teachers which uh, are experimenting by themselves. So we de de discover uh, just in some discussions that uh, people are exp <coughs> experimenting with Edusgram and it would be good to to get them. <laughs> yes, uh, and, but, and those teachers that are already independently exploring, yes, they've yes. already found themselves exactly. here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they, they're, they're doing this. But let's try <coughs> this uh, with the survey, yeah? So this, the question was, when would be the second edition and how <laughs> we can contribute uh, in... Uh, so when can this research be used elsewhere? Um, I've been arguing with my research team. Yeah. Uh, well, we've been arguing with each other about uh, should we wait until the paper is written and published mm -hmm. before we continue to use this research? Uh, it's a valid option. Um, whether or not to preemptively begin using this now as we're writing and publishing the paper, yeah. that's that's the conversation we're having now. And so, uh, there, yeah, there are research ethics okay. and, and I, things okay. that but, but they are working on it. About. But you are working on it, so. Uh, and we are working on it, and okay. there is much more research to be done. And and these kinds of questions are uh, the next step for us. We already collaborate with the university in Warsaw mm -hmm. and. Uh, and we have already applied their at Scrum and the students and the future teachers. And we are a bit impatient because we need some kind of research. Yes. We need data. Yes, <laughs> that's what we're doing. What is happening, like, it, the change is happening right now in Poland and it's huge and it's a bit out of the politics also. So we need some support to make this change. Not faster, but maybe more like Just more effective. effective. More effective. Yeah. That's why we're a bit impatient. So the the strategies that align with these uh, stages yeah. can we believe will help coaches be more effective. Yeah, yes. It, so, I'm not in the beginning mean, of the research. That's what I mean. Yeah. So that's what that's the next step is once you know where your state where your teachers are. You can then uh, assign, use the strategies for those stages with those teachers to personalize your coaching in much more uh, intentional ways. Yeah. So I'm excited for that next step. Yes. Is it fair to say that that's sort of diagnostic tool as well? That you basically say, I'm a coach or a teacher or whatever, I want to promote change to see where my participants, students, etc. are at and then... Correct. Okay. This is a yes. I would agree that this could be, could be a seen as a diagnostic tool. Could be. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, Greg, for this explanation. And I lost all the slides, but this the slide for me is given a really organic way of working behavior. This feels safe when I cannot go into the planning part. I can go back. It's okay to go back. Say, and it's okay to go back. Because there are strategies to yeah. pick and then up. you can go to next up. So you have also an escape route. Now. And that's in the original theory of Prochaska and De Clemente in their approaches to explaining how therapy is supposed to work in a way that allows for regressions to exist so that um, as individuals, something that, something that I've started to use since doing this research, and this is sort of a personal aside, forgive me, uh, but I've started to use this research in my own life you know, with diet and exercise and other health issues and education, where when I find myself here, I've started to realize that when something happens externally that drops me back here, I now know what to do. 
I know how to move myself back to the planning stage and give myself the grace and under self-understanding to know that it's going to take time to get back there, but that I can. And so there's a self-directedness that I apply to my own philosophy um, and lifestyle building. So there's more coaching that can be done with this model, uh, but this research was specific to the Edge Scrum framework. Yes. I think, I think this, this picture and the whole model is also give the students, or myself, yes. give more confidence. Ah, I may yes. go back, I may go back. I don't go in the, all, uh, all the time going up, 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 up. And yes. then going down, up, going down, up. I can go yes. back. Yeah, my professor told me to put this in here uh, because it, you know, he has spent his the last 20 years studying this theory and working with these types of survey tools. And he said that this is probably, he says that this is, in his opinion, the best visualization of the theory. Uh, so that's a compliment, and I'll take it. But, uh, but I'm glad that you appreciate it, and I think it's very meaningful. Uh, so, and Willie, I have to thank you and Christina, again, for being part of this international joint research effort. And I think everyone's going to be very thankful that you helped make this happen. No, not only me. Yeah, thank not you. Not only us. Everyone. So, thank you very much. Uh -huh.